everyone. My name is Abhay. Uh, my name is Arnold Bernstein. I live in Malibu. <clears throat> I've lived on this property for about 50 years and about 40 of them, give or take, I've been growing fruit trees, either tropical, semi-tropical or garden variety. Um, I have 140 some odd fruit trees, but I have 400 in total. So if I have 10 peaches, it's still one of the 140. One of the groups that I grow are apple trees and the discussions about apples. Before I get into it, um, please interrupt me anytime you want, unmute and just ask a question. My wife taught interpersonal communication at Pepperdine for 15 years. And, a, and according to her, if you interrupt somebody in certain areas, it's rude. However, on the East Coast, particularly New York, if you don't interrupt, it means you're not really interested. So <laughs> please ask a question or stop me if it's not clear or if I'm saying something that makes absolutely no sense. Uh, good etiquette says don't, in, don't correct the speaker. However, the corrections are how I learn and through that process, I learn more. So please correct me when you find that I'm saying something that's incorrect. Um, let me start with the story of the apple itself before I get into my yard and how I grow it. The apple comes from the Caucasus, Caucasus area, Caucasus Mountains. Uh, initially, it grew, it grew wild. In fact, to this day, it still grows wild in the Caucasus. Uh, over time, bears, horses, other mammals, or birds ate apples and through selection, picked the sweetest and through there, eating it and defecating and planting it, over time, the apple spread. Along came the uh, silk root, which ran through that area. They, in turn, picked the best apples. They ate them, discarded them along the way. So eventually, the apple got to what we now call the Middle East. It was called the Orient way back when. And from there, it spread throughout Europe. The apple uh, has five pods to it and can have up to 15 seeds. Each of those seeds will produce, or if they're obviously if they're fertilized, will produce an apple tree. But as Bob Veith, are you familiar who Bob Veith is? Bill knows who he is. Uh, uh, Bob Veith was the ex-president of California Rare Fruit Growers. And he would always say, look, the apple produces uh, fruit, the trees from seed, but each will be different. And the best parallel is you and your siblings. You're very much alike, but yet different. And that difference is how the apple tree changed over time. Um, I'm sure as a garden club, you know the difference between a, vari uh, a variety and a cultivar. Uh, a variety is natural, cultivar is cultivated by humans or a cultivated variety, that's where cultivar comes from. So once humans got involved, the apple changed dramatically uh, by selection. Oh, incidentally, my dog ate my glasses and he forget me. So I'm, I'm wearing a, an old pair of glasses and I have to do this to read. So you have to excuse me, uh, Uh, there's a, a general misconception about apples. Certain fruit trees, which Bill will tell you, will grow simply by sticking a piece of wood in the ground. Uh, figs, pomegranates, uh, grapes. However, the apple itself, will, very few of them will uh, actually do this. And the reason for this, within the apple is a, is a, uh, a bit of tasting phenology. And that's what keeps... Uh, I'm sorry. It's okay. Uh, that's what keeps uh, burrowing animals and little animals from destroying the apple. So that is the same reason why it doesn't grow simply by putting a stick in the ground. It will inhibit root growth. Root growth. 
So the apple basically has to come from seed or through grafting, or I guess nowadays that it, it could be done through uh, micro uh, techniques. But over time, it's simply seed, picking, picking seeds or grafting. Grafting, as you may know, is a process of mating a piece of wood that you want to, to grow to rootstock. The piece of wood is called a pine, the rootstock is called rootstock, obviously. The, that art has been documented for 5,000 years, and I believe probably goes back before modern farming. Um, the nonsense we were all taught was suddenly, out of nowhere, farmers appeared and they were able to domesticate uh, various grains. And through those grains, we have spare time, ergo civilization. It's nonsense. Those people knew how to cross pollinate. They were very fine gardeners. Proof of it is the story of the uh, corn. Corn comes from central Mexico. It still grows there. I think it's tessanite is the uh, name of the plant. I may be wrong. Anyway, they've now determined that modern corn is an F5 or an F6, meaning some one of people grew, crossed it, took a hundred of the 10,000 seedlings that came up, crossed them five or six times to get modern corn. Modern corn does not look anything like its forebearer. So back to my apple story. <laughs> um, If you remember your Greek, Greek history, um, Socrates' most famous student was Plato. Plato's most famous student was Aristotle. And Aristotle's most famous student was Theophratus. Uh, Theophratus is the father of modern botany. He also had another student who may not be as famous called Alexander the Great. <laughs> What Alexander the Great would do is wherever he went, he would send back seeds, plants to basically Theophratus and Aristotle himself, who was probably, I think he's known as the father of modern biology. Uh, along the way, uh, Alexander sent back something we call the spring apple. And a spring apple, I don't know where it came from, but essentially that is the grandfather of all modern rootstock. I'll get into that later as to how it bears in my story. Uh, in the first century, as, as Greece declined and Rome took over, uh, the Romans started to plant apples throughout their kingdom or uh, throughout the empire, it wasn't a kingdom, the empire. Um, they found that the best growing area was what we call Gaul or Northern uh, Europe, Normandy and areas like that. To this day, uh, that area is still a major apple producer. Um, the Romans also brought with them the art of grafting. And they're probably the ones who spread it throughout the world. Um, but they brought not only the apple, but the apple grafting. And the grafting is very important to the story as I'll, I will get into it. For about, well, 500 years, in the year 542, um, there was a, a slight ice age. And what happened was this bug that was living somewhere in Africa hitched a ride up the Nile because it was cool enough for it to survive through the desert and found its way to Alexandria. By coincidence, at that time, uh, there were some ships from Asia with an Asian rat, which served as a wonderful host for a flea that carried this bug. So in 542, the Justinian's world, there was the Justinian plague, which we call now the bubonic plague. Um, we're getting into, that's a, a, an interesting part of modern history. As they exhume old graveyards and test the DNA, they're finding that the plague was rampant. However, like all of 
these plagues, it lost its virulence. And by the ninth century, 800s, it probably died out. There's so little written at the time because of ignorance and basically illiteracy. There's not much written about it. However, during the 14th century, the city of Kaffa, K-A-F-F-A, I think, which was a terminus of the Silk Route, was under siege. The Genoan, uh, I think they were Genoans, who were being attacked by the Mongols. And the Mongols had a great idea. They had dead bodies, which they catapulted into the city of Kaffa. And the bodies carried the modern plague, Black Plague. Uh, you're going to wonder why, what this has to do with apples. I'll get there. <laughs> so the Gen Genoans escaping boarded ships, bringing with them the plague. As the ships came into port, there were phantom ships, nobody alive. And there the plague started in Europe. It is estimated that in the 400 years that it was in Europe, it wiped out somewhere between 50 and 60% of the population. To put that in perspective, if we lost 60% of the people in Thousand Oaks, or let's take a bigger area, uh, the Valley and, and uh, Thousand Oaks, you'd lose your bakers, you lose your candlestick makers, lose your talent. So. 60% loss, aside from the loss of labor, is a loss of expertise. And it's, you don't recover from that. It took Europe hundreds of years to recover from that. What happened was in Roman times, the Europeans were busy smelting and also tanning. And what they did with their byproducts is they threw them in the rivers. So by the, well, probably during the Roman time, the water from the rivers was undrinkable. That's one of the reasons why they built so many aqueducts. However, by the 15th century or 14th century, the aqueducts were in such disrepair they couldn't carry fresh water. And there was this problem, you need water to survive. Well, it turns out that if you take apples and crush them. It's easy to crush, all you need are two rocks, get your fingers out of the way, and an apple. And take the juice of that crushing, leave it out in the air, the natural yeast will ferment the apples and create cider. Cider is another word for an alcoholic beverage. It wasn't until modern refrigeration, all cider meant alcohol. The cider itself, will purify water. When mixed with water, it'll kill the contaminants. So cider becomes the most important drink. And the reason for that, well, there are other drinks such as wine, which will do the same as will beer. The problem with wine is about the time of the plague, there was again a mini ice age and the wine growing area receded. So you have the the fact that wine is labor intensive and you now have the additional labor of carting it from its growing area to where it'll be consumed. So only the church and the aristocracy could drink wine. Beer on the other hand was local, but with a diminution in population, you didn't have anybody planting the fields. Beer, hops are an annual crop. Also, it takes some expertise. So while beer will also purify water, it's impractical. So apples became the key and cider became so important that it essentially was commerce of Europe and probably Asia. Um, there, are, there are records of people's wages being paid in cider. Um, it was indispensable. About the time of the plague, shortly after the plague, a couple hundred years later, we enter what's called the age of discovery. And what happened was the Europeans devised ships that could go out to sea for long periods of time. Prior to that, ship would go out for two, three days, have to go back for provisions. Uh, so they were essentially land lovers. With the extension and with the uh, 
long sailing ships, a new problem arose, and that was scurvy. It is estimated that in Europe, in the age of discovery, two million sailors were lost. What's interesting, to me at least, is the first medical controlled experiment is on scurvy. It's in the late 18th century, conducted by a British doctor. And the control for scurvy was lime, uh, apple cider, and water. Lime, as you know, was has higher vitamin C than apples, so it was the most effective. However, the fact that they used cider means they knew that it could prevent scurvy. There is no record of scurvy in Europe during the dark during the Middle Ages, only on on, on ships. It is the <clears throat> vitamin C in the apple that browns it when you cut it open. It's the vitamin C that gives it the brown color that you see in a cut apple. So now the apple is the most important crop in Europe and he who grows apples the cheapest prevails. Enter a very enterprising group of Protestants in France called the Huguenots. The Huguenots were very efficient. They probably grafted their trees onto either uh, the spring apple, Alexander the, the Great's apple, or on wild crab apples. In any event, they were the most efficient farmers. This is the most important crop. Uh, there is no comparison. In fact, cider was so important that it was the most consumed beverage from ancient times through the 19th century. So the Huguenots enter, they're very effective at growing apples and selling apples. And that kind of, kind of really bothered the French Catholics who weren't as efficient. So there became this huge persecution of the Huguenots. Ironically, Louis XIV, who is the grandson of a Huguenot, basically expels the Huguenots. And with them comes the art of growing grafted apples. They go to the Protestant low countries, uh, Protestant countries, uh, uh, the Calvinist countries, uh, Luther, German, Sweden, England, Anglican, and to the United States. And they bring with them the technique of grafting apples and apple growing. Uh, in England, they, they were openly uh, welcomed until they started to put the English farmers out of business and they were expelled from there too. So they too join the Huguenots who make their way to the United, to, to, to the North America. And they bring with them the apple growing technique. What they found when they got to the America is that two, two things of interest. One is believing that the rivers here were polluted. They too were drinking only cider. However, our rivers were not polluted. <laughs> they were absolutely drinkable. The second was apples, as you know, know are pro most pollinated by bees. So they brought with them, or had to go back to bring with them uh, European honeybees. And that's how the honeybees got here to propagate the original, or pollinate the original apples. Um, in fact, the first nursery, commercial nursery in the Americas was run, was owned by a Huguenot. Uh, ben Franklin's uh, favorite apple was the Newton Pippin. And Newton is another word for Flushing, New York, which is right around the corner from the first nurseryman. Okay, so my story gets interesting from here. With Jeffersonian's expansion of America and into the Ohio Valley, in order to homestead, they said that you had to plant and keep 50 apple trees or pear trees, your choice, on the condition of your homestead. The theory being, if you leave the homestead, the trees will die. Therefore, that's evidence that you didn't stay on the homestead. Mm -hmm. uh, in Lincoln's time, <clears throat> pardon me, in Lincoln's time, we get into the Westwood expansion. And there too, the requirement is to plant 50 trees. So the apple tree becomes a necessity here 
for the proof of homestead, but also back to the beverage. You can't drink the water, at least you're told you can't drink the water. So you drink cider. In fact, prior to the Revolutionary War, there was more cider consumed per capita than all of the modern beverages combined. Uh, you only drank cider. And now we get into part of the story of religious persecution I love. The Catholics had their wine. The Protestants were teetotals. However, the teetotalers found that if you left the cider out on a cold night and it froze, if you took the ice off, you ended up with a, a drink that was a 50 to 60 proof called Applejack. <laughs> so that, that became the mainstay of the apple world. Uh, along comes a guy by the name of John Chapman, who has an incredible, great real estate developer, probably one of the best speculator, not developer, probably the best of all time. He had a knack for knowing where Westwood expansion would be. First, the Ohio Valley, and then into Canada, and then ultimately, uh, Western Mississippi. And what he would do is go to the cider mills and pick up seeds, and they were discarded, and there were cider mills everywhere. And he would take the seeds and go to the area that he thought would expand and partner with a young man, and they would grow seedlings. When the expansion came, he had seedlings to sell so that the uh, homesteaders could plant their 50 trees. Because his was seed, seedlings and not grafted, he could undersell all of the nurseries. Other than, well, I'm sure there were others, but he was a principal seller of seedlings. As the apples are used primarily to, to demonstrate homestead and for, um, uh, cider, it really didn't matter. An apple's an apple, although nowadays there are boutique cider companies, but essentially he got away with it. Um, when he died, he had 1,200 acres of some of the finest uh, areas in all of the West, in what they call the West. Um, he's legendary. He slept in a hollow, walked with a uh, wolf and all that nonsense, and he's better known as Johnny Appleseed. So the Westwood expansion comes, the apple comes with it. The cider, as I said, was the main beverage up until 1900s. Hmm. Um, with the expansion of the railroad to Washington, state of Washington, um, they were looking for a crop to compete with California, particularly Southern California's uh, navel orange. And I think Bill, Bill may know better. I think the crop of the mid, of Central California were almonds uh, uh, initially. Uh, no, apricot. Um, anyway, Washington needed a crop. By coincidence, in the late 1890s, the largest nursery, in fact, one of the largest today was Stark Brothers, one of whom became the governor of Missouri. Um, they decided to run a contest. Uh, the apple they had been selling was not particularly good. So they ran a contest for the best tasting apple and the uh, award or reward would be, they would buy the rice to the apple that they chose and they would sell it. The, 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 one of the Stark brothers had a name for the apple in his pocket called the Delicious Apple. And a man by the name of Hyatt out of Madison Bridges, I think it is, entered his apple. Uh, I think his name is Jesse Hyatt. It's here, but I can't read the thing. Uh, Jesse's apple is an interesting apple. He, plowing his field, he plows under this apple seedling. The following year, it's growing again. He plows it under the second time. By the third year, I don't know if he plowed it under, he decides to give the apple a shot and it grows and it produces the most wonderful fruit. He enters that into the Stark Brothers contest. 
and he wins. Unfortunately, they lost the tags. So they now have the perfect apple with the perfect name. Problem is, whose is it? Well, they run the contest again, and Jesse enters it, and he wins again. <laughs> this time they kept the tags. So the iconic apple, the uh, delicious apple, red delicious apple, becomes the winner. Back to the problem, you can't patent it. But what they did was they put so much money, they could copyright the name. So they copyright delicious apple and the iconic shape with the points on it. It, by coincidence, grows brilliantly in Washington, who, if, whose farmers are looking for a crop. The railroad's now completed. They can ship the apples to the East Coast where the money is. So happenstance puts the two together and the symbol of Washington State, I'll get to it in a minute. Let me see if I can pull it up on my screen. I'm not good at this. Remember the iconic apple symbol of Washington State, world's finest? That's your delicious apple. So the golden delicious is another contest winner, but it has nothing to do with my story. So now Washington State is growing this apple. And for the first time, apples are being grown for the table consumption. Now the Romans did have apple uh, varieties that uh, uh, cultivars that they did eat. But by and large, apples were only used for cider. They were not considered eating apples. With modern refrigeration, as I said before, you don't need to have cider. Now, one of the side effects of cider is if you leave it out and it rots, it becomes vinegar. Vinegar to pre-refrigeration was key. In the summer months, that was the only way to, well, one of the few ways to preserve food. So the apple had a double whammy, once to purify water and second to, uh, to be vinegar for preservation, both very important. Now, comes the end of the- Arnold, are you sharing your screen? Uh, no, do I have to share my screen? Oh, did you want to? Yes. Push the, uh, the button in the middle. I did. Try again. There we go. Thank you. All right. Comes the end of the 19th century, and Carrie Nation and a bunch of people decide that drinking alcohol is terrible. And the temperance league starts. And they go around ripping out apple orchards, making just destroying apple orchards without regard to what it was. This coupled with anybody, I think it's 1918, uh, Temperance, the uh, Prohibition Act. By 1918, when the United States uh, gets, gets uh, into the Temperance League, uh, pardon me, Prohibition, the government becomes the ones who are ripping out the orchards. Uh, to give you some idea of the effect, uh, in 1905, the U.S. government published a monograph, and it was the, there were 19,000 apple varieties of, cu of cultivars in the United States. And for 10 years, the Department of Agriculture went through these apples, taking out duplications, bad spellings, miss, you know, same name, the two names of the same apple, and they whittled it down to about 8,500 apples. To put it in perspective, in 250 years, we developed 8,500, 8,000 apple cultivars. Europe in 2,000 years developed about 150. Um, wow. So, of the 8,500 or 8,000 named varieties, many are lost. And what has happened over the, just recently, in the last 20 or 30 years, there are groups of people who on their weekend go find, seek out old apple growths 
capillaries and try to get the name variety, try and identify old apples. Because of this monograph, they actually can identify it. There is enough information. And on a slow news day, you'll see in a local paper, such and such found this apple in such and such as orchard along this uh, old road, et cetera. So they are rediscovering apples. Um, apples now switch to eating apples from the uh, cider apples. Cider goes out of existence virtually unknown until just recently, last 20 years, where cider mills are going back. Um, comes the depression and the apple growers uh, decide to publicize apples. And what they do is they give out apples to people and there's that iconic picture of the depression where this man in a beautiful suit is standing selling apples for five cents. Well, it, it, it got to the point where apples got up to 50%, 50 cents a piece during the depression and New York City cut that out. They forbid the sale of apples. So, so the apple now basically stays a, a, a delicious apple. The problem with the delicious apple is that over the hundred years, the delicious apple really has not changed very much, but the bugs that eat it have. So in order to sell these delicious apples, they have to be sprayed. Mother Jones published an article some not too long ago that the US Department of Agriculture did a study on apples and they just went to the supermarkets and they were virtually chemicals. There were 50 or 60 different known chemical residues on the apples. Oh. It was 100%. I forgot to know, it was such a high percentage. So essentially you're ending your breakfast, you're eating Dow chemical, a bowl of Dow chemical. Oh. Um, with the advent of organic gardening, they've proven that this is nonsense. You can grow apples successfully without chemicals. Um, there's a fire blight that affects apples. It's really a, more from more, more in pairs. <clears throat> and it's virtually destroying the Washington state apples. What they've done is they have stopped using uh, the rootstock and have transferred, they're now using, I think it's called G9, which is the development of Cornell University, which is the home of the US uh, apple repository. Um, but it seems to be uh, uh, rock, light free. That's a, that's a, that's a mouthful. Um, so they, they're getting away, from, trying to get away from using, using chemicals. Um, we grow our apples here on M111. Bill, I'm sure, has told you about it. M111 is one of the Dwarfing apple varieties. It is not a, 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 a Mollus domestic. It's not an eating apple. It simply uses rootstock. It comes out of uh, East Malling, which is a British yard. And I think the 111 was the location in the yard where this particular uh, rootstock was growing. I don't know if it was the 11th, uh, 11th rootstock in the first row, first rootstock in the 11th row. Well, the 111 <laughs> M111. <clears throat> we also use EMLA 9 and 27. 9 can be traced directly back to Alexander the Great Spring Apple. Uh, Would you please stop your share, uh, your screen share, so I that you come back big? Stop <laughs> share. There I am. Thank you. Wow, thank you. Um, rootstock does not affect the tree, taste of the tree or the apple on the tree. It limits the size of the tree. It also adapts the tree to the particular soil we have on here. The um, cyan wood determines what the apple will be. So the union of both of those 
determines the height of the tree. An apple tree will grow 40 feet. And the problem with the 40 foot tree is first he wants a thicket. Second, the only those apples exposed to the sun will get sweet. The inner apples will never be of any value unless you're making styder. So by dwarfing the tree, you now have a tree producing apples of a reasonable size. The M111 limits it to about 18 feet. Uh, ELM 27 to about 12 feet. Uh, so you can limit the size of the tree. Um, with that, I will get into my yard and I will screen share some of my apples. And Okay, that's the picture that we were talking about. Here's, a, here's a, an apple tree from my yard. See all these tags? These are graphs. And I'll have trees with 20 and 30 graphs. Um, I have, I think about 70 or 80 different apples. Bill also has an enormous number of apples. He likes to collect what we call red flesh apples which were really initially isolated by a man by the name of Edminger in Northern California, who died a hundred years ago, but they're now rediscovering some of his trees. Um, how do I get to another screen? Just keep clicking. There you go. But let me go back to this one. This is a, an apple tree in my yard. You can't see because everything's behind it. But you can see it's, it's a large tree. It got up to about 14 feet. Malibu, because of the climate, trees don't get very big. For many years, this was a growing area for nurseries. They grow the specimen trees here, the big bushy ones. And the large ones, they grow in Fillmore in the valley. Uh, so when they were doing all those uh, uh, developments of homes, home sites, they would plant the, uh, the, tree tr the street trees who were taken from uh, growing in the valley. But the tree at the clubhouse was grown in Malibu. It's just as a situation because of our climate where we just don't get the growth that you guys get. It takes me 10 years to get a producing apple tree. I mean, it'll produce like this, this is tiny. This, this tree is about seven years old. The bird in seven years has a tree you can climb. Um, hmm. the, this, you've all seen this. This looks great. And particularly when the apples grow, it looks wonderful in the catalog. What I do and the, the suggestion is, is prune off all but three. This is called the king apple, the one in the middle. Prune these off because they're going to limit the size of the apple. With three, you're going to have nice sized apples. With these, you're going to have puny little apples because they're all fighting for the same uh, nutrients. Do you keep the king apple? I like to. It's recommended. That's the one they tell you to keep. And, and um, I thought you're so frost free in Malibu. I'm, I didn't realize there were that many varieties of apples that would, that you need more chill. Uh, we'll get to chill in a minute. That's a good, let me do it now. Apple chill is nonsense. Uh, Dave Wilson planted out an experimental yard in somewhere in Orange County where they get fewer than 50 hours of chill. And he took all what's called high chill apples and planted them. The, the planting now is almost 10 years old. All of them fruited and fruited well. You can go on the internet and ask, just type in uh, low chill apples or chill apples with Dave Wilson. Uh, his contention in mind is the way chill, do you know how they determine chill, what chill is? 
<coughs> chill is a number of hours, number of hours that a tree in the winter time is above 32 degrees and less than 45 degrees. Subtract from that number, the number of hours below 32 degrees. So they're growing low chill apples from Minnesota, University of Minnesota, which is one of the three apple, grow, apple universities or universities specialized in apples. Um, successfully, fruiting well, fine taste, beautiful color. The chill's just nonsense. It, it, it doesn't. I get, I get production of virtually all my apples. One of the problems, some apples have unique characteristics. The Fuji is very slow to produce fruit. So more times than not, people will rip out a Fuji, assuming that it, it needs more chill hours, when in fact, it's just latent. It, does, it can take five to 10 years before it fruits. Um, the best apples for our area are the low chill apples, such as Anna, Einschema, uh, Golden Dorset. Uh, the Anna apple, in fact, it wasn't, it was assumed that you can't grow apples on the equator. Uh, there's a guy out in Riverside, a couple, couple Creek farms, who is a, some sort of missionary. And he is growing apples or has gotten the people of equatorial Africa to grow apples for export. They grow so many that they can export them. So chill hours really is irre irrelevant. Any other questions? Uh, I have a question. Okay. Um, so of the varieties, uh, how do you learn for the varieties that we can grow here in Southern California in our microclimate, um, how do you find the characteristics like apples that are good for cider, apples that are tart, apples that are sweet? That's a tough one. I'm not sure I can answer that. I think <clears throat> I'll take a guess at it, but here I'm really going out of my comfort zone. I can give you some recommendations. Bill can do it. Yeah, uh, really uh, quickly. Fruit. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, please. Yeah, uh, Brayburn grows great here, and Fuji does well, as well as uh, Granny Smith does quite well. Those three right there can be really, and I can start with the uh, Brayburn. John of Gold, if you can find it, would grow well, and those would be a great start for uh, for apples around here, as well as, uh, oh, for early varieties, Dorset Golden, I recommend. It's a kind of a golden, delicious seedling which actually starts uh, 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 blooming in January and will give you fruit at the end of June and then give you another crop in the fall. So that those are just some good names. And my experience is those all do well. And I have a whole bunch of other rare apples, uh, which also, and I could share cyanwood little pieces of these branches and show you how to graft them onto an apple tree. If you have a tree that's not doing so well, and I have some great varieties we could graft on besides those, but those are some great ones to start with. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, uh -huh. added to that, everyone's taste is different. Because of the acid level in your mouth, you will taste apples different than I will. So what's a good tasting apple to me may not be as pleasing to you. So it's very subjective. Uh, let me just finish up because I promised uh, the next speaker that I can. Uh, this is a fertilizer can. Uh, I use blood meal in here and it leaches into the system. So when I water my trees, they get fertilized. Um, huh. It's a very efficient way. I, I, Never used chemical fertilizer of any type. I've ne never used uh, any um, uh, bug spray. My at my yard is completely organic, although not certified. These are five inches. They're simply bended board with a couple of screws in them. 
fact, I can expand it so you can see. And they're five inches. I mulch up to five inches. I go to the local tree trimmers and ask them to dump uh, a truckload of uh, chips and I put them in my yard. And that essentially cuts my water bill because the mulch keeps the water in the soil. The watering goes through the mulch and it's a very effective way to cut your water bill. Um, I use these, well, I have a better picture. I use these heads. I saw them used at UC Riverside in their orange orchard. And uh, I saw Dave Wilson's uh, growing yard, they use them as well. The advantage to this is if you really want to get large crops of apples, stop watering in oh, August, September, well, limited watering, and cut the water down. You can turn these off where normal drip in the pipe, it's very hard to cut it off. Uh, I mean, you can do it, you can get valves, but it, it's, this is easy, just go and twist the top of it. And it throws a circle of water and that fertile, that keeps everything moist and growing. And I found it's a very efficient way to be water wise. Um, so I have a couple, I have a couple of questions. Are you saying that you, every time you water, you're fertilizing time, with, with blood yes. meal? It's an injector. It fertilizes a, a minuscule amount. Of every, water. every time. Okay. And, yes. um, with this many trees, and I've got to assume you have a huge crop and do you have uh, help? Uh, what do you do with your crop? And and are you doing this all by yourself or do you hire a crew to come and trim for you or harvest well, with you? Uh, or? Uh, trimming, back to trimming. Uh, we keep the trees to eight feet, except for this one that right out of hand. Um, there's no reason to have a fruit bearing tree more than eight feet. If you can't pick it from the ground, don't go to any pot. All it is, the fruit will out on the tree for it. I have the biggest, healthiest plants in the neighborhood. They are the size of a good sized cat. They absolutely eat all of my fruit. My whole objective is to get the fruit before they do. <laughs> uh, as to caring for the yard, by using the mulch, I have no weeding, li limited uh, weeding. Um, I have two people coming, it used to be uh, half a day <clears throat> or one man day a month. Uh, don't forget, I have an acre and I also grow other things. So because of the way we fertilize, because of the way we weed, it's really a low, low maintenance yard, much lower than you would think. Uh, with this, I'm going to end. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. No questions. Deanna, it's all yours. Is there ever a time we might be able to come in and tour your yard? It sounds wonderful. Uh, it's a little problematic, particularly with COVID and my age. Yes. So okay. let's leave that for the future. Will do. So Thank you so much. So Arnold, I loved it. Are you going to stop sharing your screen now? Uh, thank you. Yes. Yes. There I'm you are. Okay. We <laughs> loved it. Very nice. Thank you, Bill. Good job. <laughs> Excellent. Is there anyone else who has questions for Arnold? <laughs> 